Hi, welcome to Financial Planning Explained, and I'm your host, Mike Menninger, certified financial planner, owner, and founder of Menninger and Associates Financial Planning. Um, my second week here in the new studio. Uh, it's still work in progress under construction, um, but however, I, I can't help but congratulate RVN TV for the job that they're doing. They moved into a beautiful, beautiful space. It reminds me of what I did about a year and a half ago. Uh, I moved into a really, really nice office space, and it makes it really enjoyable for me and everyone else to be able to come into the office on a daily basis, and I can't wait to bring in guests uh, into the new space. So uh, until then, I uh, came up with an idea that shared it with a few other folks of coming up with case studies that I could share. Um, purpose of this is really, you know, the case study, uh, I remember the old days for Dragnet, you know, names and change to protect the innocent. Well, fact of the matter is, is that I use these case studies as, call it real life examples, but what they are is I come across a particular case in my travels, if you want to call it that, and I might pull together, you know, some of the details from that particular case, some from others, and kind of pull them all together, because the whole purpose of the show is really designed to be um, financial plan and explain. Imagine that. It's the name of the show. So um, I try to pull in different things because what enables me to do is to be able to touch upon often used but little thought ideas and then I pull together and I kind of now create this case study. So it's kind of based on fact, but it's not really based on fact. The fact is what brought me to the idea of pulling the case study together. So uh, I'm going to introduce you to Sandy, okay? Sandy is a 54-year-old woman. Uh, she's divorced, and she has two sons. Um, her ex-husband died, and also her father recently died, okay? Her father died in 2020. And I bring up died in 2020 because I wanted to point out differences between tax laws that occurred effective January 1st of 2020. Okay. Also, she has no plans to remarry. All right. And that is an important component that we're going to talk about here later. So I talk about, uh, and, and by the way, she also makes a pretty good living. She earns about $120,000 a year. I threw that in there because of the fact that it kind of makes additional twists to developing a really, really cool case study. Okay, I actually created this, and when I was creating it for the show, I actually pulled all of my staff from my uh, office and brought them in and said, hey, you know, we got to look at all this because it's a really cool thing that I just dreamt up. Anyway, so I reference died in 2020. Why? Because the SECURE Act, which came out effective January 1st of 2020, made a handful of changes, but in, in, as it pertains to this particular case study, the biggest change that impacted the case study is if you are the beneficiary of an IRA, you taking that money out, the rules changed. Now, let me step up or, and back up and say, non-spouse beneficiary. Nothing changed with the spouse. So if your spouse dies, you could take their IRA or Roth IRA and take it and make it become yours and all of the rules that apply to your IRA and Roth IRA continue to apply, specifically as it pertains to required minimum distributions. So you take a spouse's IRA that becomes yours. Now your required minimum distributions occur once you turn age 72, which, by the way, occurred also that year. That was one of the changes. The changes, and, and it's remarkable how many people are still stuck on the old numbers, um, the required minimum distribution rules switched. So instead of it being 70 and a half, it is now 72, which I love that because of the fact that I'm going to go off on one of my little tangents. Who in the world came up with 70 and a half? 
Okay. Who came up with 59 and a half for the time that you could take money out of an IRA without paying any uh, penalty? It's not as if we're converting from metric to English. Okay, I'm done with my rant. For 59 and a half, 70 and a half, who comes up with this? Why not 60 and 70? Anyway, went off of my tirade. Anyway, so age 72 is when you have to become or begin taking a required minimum distribution. However, if you are the non-spouse beneficiary, which we created here, okay, is in the old rules, okay, in fact, when I say the old rules, the old, old rules prior to, I think it was 1999, under the really old rules, you had to actually take the money out within five years. Then they changed it, I believe, in 1999, that they called it, there's a lot of different terms, the inherited IRA, beneficiary IRA, specifically the stretch IRA, because what it did is if I inherited an IRA from someone other than my spouse, it used to be based on my life expectancy, okay? And it had different required minimum distributions, RMD rules, than did for your own IRA, but it was based upon my lifetime. So if I inherit an IRA when I'm 50, and they assume my life expectancy is 40 years, I have to take 1 40th out, then 1 39th, 1 38th, 1 37th, so on and so forth. So if a person dies after 2019 or 2020 and above, then the rules are different. Okay, now, everybody who's in the old rules are grandfathered in. They're staying under the old rules. However, under the new rules, you have to take the money out within 10 years. All right, now, that means you can wait 10 years and take it all out on the back end. Okay? Or you could take it evenly. You could take it all out up front. It doesn't matter. All the money out has to be out by December 31st, 10 years after date of death. So if in this particular instance, if Sandy's father died on July 1st of 2020, all that money has to be out by December 31st of 2030. Okay? Now, let's talk about that. <laughs> That's problematic, all right? So I'm gonna go on to this little rant for a little bit. The rule changes of IRAs to the non-benefit or non-spouse beneficiaries, trust me, has taken on extraordinarily important estate planning techniques. So if you're a married couple and either or both of you have substantially large IRAs and you have a small amount of children, and I've got clients with over two million dollars in IRAs with one child and I'm like holy smokes do you realize what you're doing to that child when you pass away they're gonna be receiving all of that money in all likelihood if you were to just take a look at what's the average time that somebody dies their children are in their prime earning years and if you take them while they're in their prime earning years and say, hey, children, not only do I love you, I'm going to stick you with this IRA and jam you with all this money that you have to take out. Take my word for it. If you have or your parents have sizable enough IRAs, then you really, really need to think about the planning of that. And, you know, we've developed a lot of plans. What we like to do is we like to do multi-generational planning. So if I have, uh, call it the grandparents, have sizable enough IRAs, and we got the children are making decent money, there's a lot of times that we actually name grandchildren as the beneficiaries to bypass the children in their prime earning years. Separate issue, I'm going off tangent, but it's important to understand. So as it pertains to this particular case, she just received a $900,000 inherited IRA in 2020, okay? That's a problem, okay? So she's 54 years old, she has a $900,000 inherited IRA, and she already makes 120 grand. She's gonna get creamed by all this income. Or if she waits until the end, Using rule of 72, rule of 72 says if you take 72 divided by rate of return, a certain rate of return tells you how many years it's going to take to double. Let's assume a 7% rate of return. 
72 divided by 7 is 10. Her money doubles in 10 years. Guess what? In 10 years, 900,000 is 1.8 million. Take 1.8 million now all at once, and boy, I do not want to be hanging around her household on April 15th when it's time to have this discussion with the IRS. So the whole idea here is what do we do about this inherited IRA, okay? How do we maximize tax efficiency now? How do we maximize tax efficiency all throughout that entire 10-year period? If you were to take out $900,000 periodically using a reasonable rate of return, we're talking about adding about $130,000 of income every year. You take $130,000 of income tap on top of $120,000 of income, guess what? Sandy is paying the piper in taxes. So what do you do? Okay, well, okay, first of all, that's just looking at that aspect of it. I always like to say, all right, here are the, the rules on the table, but let's talk about what are your goals and objectives. Sandy, what are your goals and objectives? Well, you know, I'd like to retire eh, somewhere around age 62, maybe once I begin collecting Social Security or 65, and I can't tell you the most common time. Well, I can't retire until I'm 67 because that's what Social Security says. And I'm like, forget Social Security. Social Security, all that is, is the big number in the upper right-hand corner of page one. What you want to be able to do is retire when you want to retire, okay? Don't worry about Social Security. That's when they think, that's when that's your full retirement age. It's sort of a, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's, it's, it, it's, it's defined as your full retirement age number. You can begin to collect Social Security any time of your own after age 62. However, Sandy has an extra nuance sitting here, okay? But anyway... So we look at our goals, and she said, well, you know, I'd like to live on, uh, you know, whatever I'm living on now, it's plenty. I said, okay, and I'd like to retire at age 65 because that's when I can get Medicare. I'm like, okay. I said, well, what about age 62? Oh my God, I, if I could retire at 62, I'd love to. I'm like, well, that's when you're eligible for Social Security. And I said, how much do you need to live on? Well, you know, I said, how much are you living on now? Oh my goodness, I, you know, I, I, I'm more than enough. I make more than enough to live on. I live very rather frugal, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, okay, fine. So let's talk about it. So what we did is, you know, before getting into some of the nuts and bolts, we wanted to do is to be able to run some numbers here and say, you know, based on your cost of living, can you retire at age 60? Well, lo and behold, the answer to that was yes because I had some sneaky scheming things in the back of my head. It's not sneaky, it's, it's legit. Okay, I said, I have an idea. Tell me what you think of this. You know, if you're thinking of retiring at age 65, you'd love me if you retired at age 62. I said, how much would you love me if you began to retire at age 60? He said, oh, I would really love you then. I said, all right. So we ran the models and everything else and it demonstrated that you should, but how do we make it so that the federal government isn't one of our primary beneficiaries because holy smokes, we've got $120,000 of income, we've got that $900,000 uh, inherited IRA, what do we do now? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back from the break. After the break, we're gonna start talking about some of the things, some of the ideas, some of the solutions that we could do in this particular situation. So. Stick with me. Uh, after this commercial break, we'll pick right up right where we left off. Thank you. Have you saved enough for retirement? Are you financially prepared for an emergency or unexpected event? Have you thought about your financial future? Hi, I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. For over 20 years, we have been answering our clients' questions just like these as we develop unique and comprehensive financial plans tailored to meet their needs. When addressing your financial plan, we incorporate your entire financial picture, including taxes, estate planning, as well as investment planning and retirement planning. So call us today for a complimentary no obligation consultation. A unique approach to financial planning.
Welcome back to Financial Plan and Explained. My name is Mike Menninger, I'm your host. Certified financial planner, I'm in the midst of a case study, and this is cool, this is a cool one, all right? So, here we've got Sandy, who makes about $120,000 a year, uh, but, but a couple nuances. The nuances are, number one, uh, her father had died in 2020, left her about $900,000 of an inherited IRA. Yikes, oh, I mean, that's not a bad yikes, it, but you know, the government's standing waiting for their piece of it. And then also, she earns about $120,000 a year, and an interesting nuance was that uh, her divorced husband also just died. I said, very interesting, so I said, Sandy, check this out. So what I did is I said, look, Let's, let's take a look at this for a moment. And really, during the course of your lifetime from this point moving on, we've got a handful of milestones. Now, a lot of times I'll take milestones and say, you know, for, for anybody, you've got age 55, 59 and a half, 60, 62, 65, 67, uh, 70, and 72. And believe it or not, she hits most of them. Um, 55 is when you're first eligible to take money out of a retirement. If, if you leave a company, you can take money out of that retirement plan, little known fact, without paying, um, uh, without paying a 10% penalty. But anyway, in this particular case, I said, look, I said, here's a way to maximize tax efficiency. Okay, start first with, will we accomplish your goals and objectives? And if the answer is yes, then how in the world can we make it so that the federal government is not one of your primary beneficiaries, okay? Because I look at her income and I look at that $900,000 inherited IRA and I say, how can we avoid getting smoked by taxes on the income and the inherited IRA? So. Then, which I didn't even talk about yet, is the fact that her husband died, late husband, now mind you, she was married for over 10 years, divorced, and he died and she hasn't remarried. So if she is not married at age 60, she can actually begin to collect 71.5% of his full retirement age, Social Security. Meanwhile, what she does at that point, between the two of them, she was the higher breadwinner, okay? Doesn't matter. The point is, is that she could begin taking 71.5% of his Social Security and allow hers to grow all the way up to the age 70 when hers goes 24% uh, above her full retirement age. Okay, her full retirement age number is over $3,000. So she's going to have about, uh, what, $3,700 is going to be her, 3, 000, her age 70 number. Meanwhile, she's picking up all of that money between age 60 and 70 is effectively for free because no matter when you take your own, it's considered actuarially the same. Free money. Free money from the government's even better. Okay, but how do we prevent donating? All right, so I said, look, we got a bunch of milestones here. Between the ages of 54 and 60, here's what we can do, okay? You continue earning your $120,000 a year, but I want you to max out your 401k. It's just, well, what do I do then to live? And I said, like, don't worry about it. So it turns out that she doesn't need it, but if she did, that's fine. So what we're going to do is we're focusing on taxes. Okay, the amount of income that she can earn before jumping into the high tax bracket. Okay, you figure there's, I like to simplify it. You got low tax bracket, medium tax bracket, high tax bracket. We're trying to avoid the high tax bracket because even the medium tax brackets are low in the historical tax brackets. So what we do is we contribute the maximum amount to her 401k. So if she's making 120 grand and we contribute 27,000 to her 401k, then basically her W-2 income is 93 grand. 
So if that's the case, and she can make up to 180, this gives us the ability to pull like 90 grand out of the inherited IRA and pay in the lower income tax bracket. And it's, meanwhile, she's pumping the daylights out of her 401k. It's just, but what do I do with the money? I'm like, well, don't worry about it. What we do is we use the inherited IRA, we'll withhold the appropriate amount of taxes to make sure that the government's satisfied, and we put the rest of it into your individual, we create, we haven't one already, but we create and we add to your individual investment account. As if you really want to get creative, which I confirmed with a CPA, is if you wanted to take $90,000, and let's say that's the number, okay, and, and the amount of taxes that you needed to take out was 20 grand, what you could do is you could take $70,000 up front in the beginning of the year and then take the $20,000, withhold it, and send it directly to the IRS, and apparently that's legit. So then instead of it growing inside the inherited IRA, which is growing in a tax deferred, which is also not the best because if you have it in a non-qualified account, that gives you the ability to roll up in uh, capital gains or even munis, which are tax-free uh, tax municipal bonds. So you got a lot more investment flexibility without kicking the can down the road and having to pay ordinary income. But anyway, so what you do is you pull that money out, which means that we're avoiding the giant time bomb. So now for the next several years, continue working, bang the daylights out of the 401k, and then subsequently taking the appropriate amount out of the inherited IRA. Now, let's be practical. From an execution perspective, we don't take the entire amount out at the beginning of the year. Because the funny thing that happens is that with almost everybody during the course of the year, they get bonuses, they get you know raises, they get whatever. So what we do is we try to reasonably project it. And then Still, at the end of the year, which, you know, with our firm, we're really busy in Q4 because it's year-end tax planning. This is a perfect example of year-end tax planning. We take a look and say, how much income can we pull from your inherited IRA to stay below that threshold that would otherwise put you in a higher income tax bracket? So what are we doing? We're doing this every year from age 54 until she turns 60. Okay, at which point what we're trying to really do is bleed that money out of that inherited IRA so that she doesn't get smoked in the 10th year. Okay, so we're bleeding it out, bleeding it out, bleeding it out. And mind you, I'm taking 10% out. Say, God forbid, but you know, in the last couple years, we've had extraordinary growth in the markets. That may not even be enough to keep up with the rate of growth certainly not projected in the future, but you know we're trying to bleed this thing out, okay? because we know it has to come out within 10 years. So then what happens at age 60? Well, now we're in a different situation. What we do is that we now can begin to collect Social Security where she stops working. And once she stops working, we still try to stay below that threshold okay, of the higher income tax bracket, but the problem is, is between now and then, that the tax brackets are supposed to change at the end of 2025. We're currently in the lowest income tax bracket system that we've been in in over 100 years. So we want to maximize and, and capitalize on that low income tax bracket system. So we see her and pull that out, and then once she stops working at age 60, her only income at that point is going to be her Social Security, okay, which she's getting from her late ex-husband. So. And that's going to be to the tune of almost $2,000 a month. So now, now we can increase the amount that she's withdrawing from the inherited IRA to stay below that threshold. And we're doing the same thing. We're taking the money and we're just pumping it right into the investment account. Or during these years, she has the ability to also pull money out. Okay, And also at the same time, we're taking some of her original IRA assets and we convert to a Roth IRA. Now, we're trying to bleed the money out, but by converting to a Roth IRA, what we're trying to do is establish the five-year time clock with which 
any subsequent Roth IRA contributions or Roth IRA conversions will then become tax-free. So we keep this up until she runs out of the inherited IRA money. Age 65, guess what? Now all of a sudden she has Medicare. Okay, now her Medicare kicks in, so her cost of living comes down by close to $1,000 a month where she was otherwise paying medical insurance. Now, age 67, for most, would be full retirement age, but in her particular instance, is what that means is that if she wanted to, she could actually go back to work, okay? Because as you, you know, same work goes when you're collecting the, um, from, your, from your spousal benefit, or survivor benefit, you're st still restricted on how much you can make. At age 67, if she chose to go back to work, she could and she can make as much as she wants. Then at age 70, she flips the switch, goes to her elevated um, uh, Social Security, and then age 72 is when her required minimum distributions kick in. But the other thing that she'll be doing all along the way is we're converting then her existing IRA that she contributed to the 401k, which is now an IRA, we convert that to a Roth IRA while she's under the, the tax bracket. So needless to say, this is an extraordinary opportunity to consider the whole idea of financial planning is everything's integrated with each other. You've got the uh, tax planning, which is what we're doing every year. We've got the retirement income planning, which is what we planned on doing. We've got the estate planning, because we're now having to watch out what happens from her parents' estate to her, but now her potential estate to her children, and clearly the tax planning, if I didn't say it already. So, perfect example of how so many different pieces can come together when developing a comprehensive financial plan for a particular individual. If you haven't figured it out, I love this stuff. Okay, the more complex, the more fun it is. So, anyway, uh, I, I hope some of these ideas, the tidbits and what have you. I hope this was cool. I uh, hope you found it as cool as I did. Um, I had fun with it, as you could tell. And so, you know, shameless plug, more than happy to, to spend time with you. If you have questions, feel free to give us a call. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, until next week, I'm your host, Mike Menninger of Financial Planning Explained. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.